cool. And let's share that again. There we go, and we're back. Cool, and we're recording. Um, so yeah, we're gonna let's jump straight into it. So we're gonna look at some periodization and planning. Um, I'm gonna introduce myself for those that, that don't know me. Uh, if you fancy reading up, I have a nice website. Uh, I had that done last year, so have a look. It's nicely designed. And that's lukehurstelfitness.co.uk. Uh, and you can find me on Instagram, which is at Ursel73, and I'll put most of the, the fun stuff that I'm doing on there. A um, few things that I've done, you might see some people you recognize. Um, I've trained motocross athletes to a, a, a national and an international level. Uh, I've coached sprinters uh, specifically. So if you look at the picture, uh, we've got Alex Cooper there. He won, his for his age group, he won the 400 meters English champs and that was that was a really good victory for us because uh, he'd been turned away by some running clubs thinking he didn't have it and with some good coaching and not just me I was his S&C coach there was a whole team around him um, uh, and he had some fantastic track field coaches um, as well so that was a really good win for him. I've got um, there I am doing a chest massage to warm up Eddie Hall he that was the day he didn't he didn't break the uh, the, it wasn't the 500 kilo deadlift, but he broke the tandem deadlift. There were two of them. It was him and Mark Felix. And they pulled, I think, like 800 kilos, uh, seven something. Uh, ridiculous, because it was two of them and they both did the deadlift at the same time. Um, and Ryan is actually, there's a picture of him there and he's in this webinar. Uh, he's he's in, in the crowd there somewhere. Um, and there's Jack between us. Jack's a professional boxer going on to his uh, fourth fight, is it fourth, fifth professional fight? I, I should know that, but I don't. Uh, I'll give you an insight into his, uh, into his program as well. So just a few bits that I've done. Um, uh, Britain's Strongest Man, I actually ended up treating the commentators. That's Bill Kazmaier, a bit of a legend in his own right on the bottom left. So I've done a little bit um, around the sporting industry. Hopefully I've, I've you know, I've, I've done enough to have an opinion and it's hopefully valid. Um, okay, so I'll just check the, I'm um, checking the chat box, have I, see if anyone, I've lost it, chat, cool. Not so, I'll just check that. Hockey and tennis, cool. Hopefully uh, we'll learn some things that'll, that'll transfer over to those sports. Um, yeah, so this is uh, primarily this is strength and conditioning based as well. Um, so you have to remember for a lot of sports, they'll have a, a strength and conditioning coach, which is where I sit, and then a, a sports coach that deals with the specific skills. And they do cross over quite a lot um, in the training. But that's, I'm kind of from that, that strength and conditioning background. So everyone can see this okay if you can't send me a send me a message in the chat box um i haven't done a full presentation like this before so uh, i hope it works um so the difference between exercise and training that's what i wanted to talk about because people never differentiate between that or, or very rarely um and there's nothing wrong with either the point of this is that they're two different things not that one is superior to the other exercise is fun um it's movement but there's not really any end goal and i go out exercising all the time we go for walks or maybe i'm bored and i go on the spin bike and and just burn off some calories and it releases endorphins makes us feel good um and movement's never bad for us you know all the research we build up just shows that we're designed to move when we pump skeletal muscles we get uh you know lymphatic flow and, and blood flow and you know uh, it reduces anxiety and stresses and just moving is is better than not moving so i'm definitely not saying that one of these is better than the other but they are two separate things training on the other hand is planned you know there's an end goal and each training block is going to build on the block previous okay and i get loads of people they talk about training but then i'm like okay so what did you do today oh, well, i went on a on a 50 mile bike ride cool why did you do that well, you know, cycling, it's fitness. And I'm like, well, yeah, but what was, the, what was the reason? Was it planned or did you just wake up and decide to do it? Um, if it wasn't planned and it wasn't periodized, then it wasn't training, it was exercise, which is still definitely not a bad thing. I'm, I'm not saying one is better than the other, um, but we're gonna be looking at that 
that training portion rather than exercise and looking at that periodization. So I think I've already answered this, but we'll, we'll see what I wrote. Um, Periodization is, is real measurable uh, effective results. It's, it generally sits in a, it goes to a, in a linear fashion, generally, and each session you do should take you closer to your goal. So the first thing you need to do is to establish what your goal is. Um, and we will, we will talk about that in a little while, but for now, let's leave this. Uh, for now, let's stick to where we are. Uh, so there needs to be some kind of progression. Like I said before, each block needs to build upon the one previous, you know? Uh, people always say, you know, I'm doing chest day today, I'm doing leg day, or today's arm day. And that's fine, but even in the sets and the reps, there's no, there's no consistency. They just turn up and they just destroy whatever body part they have on for that day. Uh, and that's, it's, it's again, not a problem. It's totally fine. People are moving. I'd rather people do that than do nothing. Um, but it's not really an intelligent approach. Okay, so let's think a little bit more deeply into that. Now, before I move on to this one, I know I've already changed the slide, but Dan John, uh, I'm a big fan of Dan John. I love his books. Uh, the way he kind of puts everything out is brilliant. He says there's park bench and, and bus bench workouts and I quite like that analogy it talks about you have a bench in a park and you, you take a seat in that in that bench and you know you see a squirrel hello Mr squirrel you see a bird hello Mr bird and you can sit there for as long as you like and you, you're not trying to get anywhere you're just enjoying the view and that's what exercise gives us but you take that same bench and you put it in a bus stop now when you're sitting on a bus bench you're not enjoying, you might be enjoying the view, but you want that bus to come along uh, and you want to get on that bus and you want to get somewhere. So uh, training is, is, you know, looking at real bus bench workouts, as, as Dan John would say. I'm a big, big Dan John fan. I'd recommend any of his, any of his works. So uh, progressive overload. It's the basis of all of our programming, really. Um, this is, we, we call this general adaptation syndrome, or sometimes it's abbreviated to gas. Um, and this is how we get fitter. We have a training stimulus, uh, whatever stimulus that is, we'll talk about the different characteristics later. And then we have this alarm phase and we drop in fitness. You, you should be, if you've done an exercise session correctly, you should be less fit than you were uh, when you started. Uh, that's the whole point. You are purposely damaging your body um, in order for it to come back fitter. And that's what this kind of the graph coming back up and you can see the performance coming up. Uh, we call that compensation when it comes to the same level you were before. And then when you come up, that's super compensation. You, you're getting uh, fitter. And that happens in the rest. It doesn't happen in your training. So people that never take a day off, they never, they never allow for this. Uh, so what happens is they're here, they train, they become less fit. And as they're coming back up, they train again and they get even less fit and they get even less. Fit. And they're actually pushing themselves into overtraining. Now, overtraining is a term that's used far too much. Most of the time, people are just overreaching. They've just overdone it. In fact, some of my programs purposely push people into overtraining. But I know that's happening because I'm keeping an eye on it. And then I give them a week off and then they come back feeling amazing. But like a few days before they have that week off, they hate me. Like they're borderline having a cold. They feel awful. Um, I have to be very careful at that point that I don't push them into overtraining. Um, and that's when I give them, give them the, the week off and then they come back and then all of a sudden their numbers are there and they're feeling great. And this is what we want over time, this drop and then up then drop and then up so uh over over a period of time um we we increase our performance uh, relatively relatively simple uh now quick note on overtraining people always feel like uh, if they're aching they feel like they've overtrained uh it's not true aching actually uh, it's called doms delayed onset of muscular soreness and it's actually not related to how hard you've trained. Um, how much you ache is actually how much, what we call eccentric loading that you've endured. Eccentric is the, is the lowering phase of any exercise. When you go down into a push-up, 
uh, that's the eccentric phase and people utilize this all the time. I do in my strength training and you know, it's, it's something I've actually been playing with for a little while is playing with like isometric and eccentric loading and I'll, I'll talk about that later on uh, and it works really well but if you have an abundance of eccentric loading you're going to ache a lot more uh, than if it's all concentric. So um, if you did a sprint session running down a hill your muscles are having to eccentrically load in order to control your descent. So you're going to ache a hell of a lot more than if you did an uphill sprinting session. Uh, and there's been numerous studies on this. Um, but that doesn't mean that running downhill is better than running uphill. It always amazes me that people judge how good their workout was on how much they ache. It's, it's not a bad thing, but it's not good either. It's just not relevant. It just means that you've endured a lot of eccentric loading. If I wanted to make you ache, in a, in a personal training session, if I could, it would be really easy. I just do loads and loads and loads of eccentric loading and you definitely wouldn't thank me for it. Um, so yeah, anyway, um, the takeaway in that home, the take home message there is you get fitter when you rest, not when you train, which you should, or you know, all of you will probably already know that. Uh, it just needs hammering home a little bit sometimes. Um, and there are some really good recovery methods that the athletes use. One of my favorites is the, the hot and cold treatments. Um, you might have seen people use ice baths, but with some research, I don't, I don't know if you know this, but ice, ice baths are basically useless. They don't really do anything. They reduce a little bit of pain sensation and that's about it. It's like icing injuries. There is no, um, there is, there's no evidence to tell us that icing an injury reduces inflammation. If anything, it might make the inflammation a little bit worse. Um, but what does work really well is hot and cold treatments. So I've got a hot tub out back, only one of the cheap blow up ones, and I'm in the process of trying to buy a, a wheelie bin. I want to buy a new one because I don't want to use mine because it's super gross. And I'm going to fill the wheelie bin with ice cold water, throwing ice in there, uh, and then use it as a plunge pool. And when you go jump in the wheelie bin, Stay in there for about two minutes and then you get into the hot tub and what happens is, well, you should, you should know this, when you get cold, the blood kind of take, comes away from the distal areas of the body. That's why when you get frostbite, your fingers and toes are the first things to go because uh, it's trying to protect the vital organs. So all your blood comes to the center of your body then you jump in the hot tub and it all goes to, it, you, you, it's really weird, your fingertips and your, your toes all tingle um, and, and you're getting this like flushing effect um, so you're flushing out lymphatic fluid, uh, getting rid of kind of waste products and that kind of thing. Um, so yeah, really, really useful for recovery. Um, and I've, I've sat in with some of the best athletes in the world and a lot of them uh, put all their focus into recovery and, and not training. Um, everyone can train hard. There's no, you know, anyone can train hard enough so they throw up. That's, that's no real skill. So, uh, I'm just going to check my notes because I'm a bugger for going on tangents and then not coming back to it. Uh, progressive overload, the one thing I've got, uh, I never liked this analogy, but I know that what a lot of the strength guys will, will use is, is Milo and the calf. It's an old tale about Milo who carried the calf up, up, a, up a hill and then as the calf grew, Milo then had to become stronger to carry it. And it just, it's just a, a simple way of talking about progressive overload. In reality, it doesn't actually work like that. We need drops and we need increases in intensity. So really what you need is a few different calves at various stages of its development. So you can carry the big one and then drop back to the light one and, uh, and that kind of thing. So we can get a better periodization. Anyway, volume and intensity. Uh, as one increases, the other one must decrease. Um, and this is quite obvious, I think, that uh, some people get this, get this muddled up. By intensity, we are talking about how hard you're working. Um, but as, as, like I say, as one increases, the other one must decrease. So intensity is how hard you're working and volume is how much you're doing. Okay, And, and it's really simple. As one increases, the other has to drop. Uh, the speed at which you would run a marathon should be much slower than the speed you would run 100 meters. 100 meters is very high intensity, uh, but for a very short duration, for a very small amount of volume. 
uh, a marathon, on the other hand, it's not the intensity that gets you. The, it's not the speed that gets you. It's holding that speed over a very long period of time. And that's why a marathon is hard. Now, I'm saying it's not very intense. I'm not saying that it's not difficult. Sometimes people get that mixed up when I've been in a, a seminar before and someone's got, are you telling me marathons are easy? No, I'm, I'm just saying that it's, it's, the, it's the volume that gets you uh, not not the intensity, okay. And this, you know, as one goes up, one must come down. Uh, and people tell me that like oh, I train high volume and high intensity, and and nearly universally when I see them train, they're not training as intense as they think they are. Um, I can think of a few examples of that, but we won't talk about that here. Uh, so we're going to talk about a needs analysis. So whatever your sport is, I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to bring up the chat box. Um, oh, how hot, how cold. Uh, there is, sorry, I only just caught that. Uh, there is um, numbers for that. I, I don't know them. <laughs> um, proper sporting facilities will have a cryo chamber that's set to whatever degree it needs to be and will have the hot tub set. Uh, my hot tub, I'm aware, my hot tub doesn't go high enough and my cold bath doesn't go cold enough, so I just make them as hot and as cold as I can endure um, because I don't have any scientific way of, of showing that. Doing something is better than nothing. Um, I don't know is the answer. Uh, if you Google it, the numbers are are there somewhere. I just, I'm aware that I don't have the means to get them perfect, so I just do it the best I can. Um, so... Let's talk about the demands of your sport. So let's get you involved a little bit here so I'm not just talking to my laptop. Somebody give me a sport. Just throw something on the chat box. Hockey. Okay, let's use hockey. Sorry, Ash, you were beat. Um, there is a way to annotate this. So here's what I would do. Sorry, I'm going to draw a line. There we go. That's cool. Let's do a line. Bro. So. Hold on, I didn't get that. Annotate, draw, line. Oh, and I've gone back. How have I done that? Hold on, guys, sorry. What have I done here? Right, okay, let's close that. Let's go back. Uh, let's try this again. How did I do that? So, black, line, cool. Um, let's undo that. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to do a analysis of hockey. Tiddlywinks. Um, I am the king of cool sports. So I'll talk about that later. So what you do is you measure each of those qualities to the one previous. Okay. So in hockey, how important is... I've completely lost my mouse. Oh, God. There we go. Found it. It's not. That is okay. I've lost my mouse. <laughs> right. We'll do this on a piece of paper. You can write these out. So what we would do here, uh, we'd look at hockey and we'd say, is hockey more? I think annoying me. Is hockey more or less important than hypertrophy? Hypertrophy being muscle size. Um, again, this this. This depends on the athlete. It's not going to be very clear cut. Um, hockey is going to, you know, it's going to depend on the athlete. I, I'm, I'm not too familiar with hockey, but I'm going to assume it, positioning. You're going to get slightly different sizes. Some guys need to be need to be bigger than others. So it's going to be personal as well. So is endurance uh, more or less important than? Sorry, which is more important, hypertrophy or endurance for hockey? Someone, someone tell me. Pop that in the chat box. Are you ready? Endurance. Cool. So I, I've lost my mouse for some reason. I, I don't know why. So I'm sorry, guys. I'm going to have to skip that task because keep, I keep losing my mouse. So what I would do is put a tick by endurance. Then you'd measure endurance against strength. You know, which is more important in hockey, endurance or strength. And then I'd give a tick to whichever is most important. And I would repeat that process 
through every single characteristic. So once I've done endurance, I wouldn't do that again because I've already measured it against them all. And I'd measure hypertrophy against strength, hypertrophy against power, hypertrophy against speed, against coordination, flexibility, agility and balance. And then by the end of that, I will have created some data about what is the most important quality for my sport. Does that make sense? Um, yeah, and then from there, we can build our program around that and look at the characteristics that we want to improve on. Now, a few things that I just want to talk about is the importance of things like strength, though. Uh, people, are other people able to annotate this? Or did I just do that? Okay, All right, let's move on to the next slide. I don't know how to get rid of my yellow mark there. So, quick word on specificity. Really, for your sport, you need to be looking at what is the best you know, for your sport. What characteristics do you need to improve on for your sport? And you have to understand that getting better at some characteristics will make you worse at others. Okay? Flexibility, for example, I've got this on here. How, how useful is flexibility for a strongman or even a cyclist? It is basically useless. Okay, if anything, it would be a hindrance. Um, and this is what we mean when we talk about specificity. And I sometimes even delve into what we call um, functional dysfunction. We always assume that dysfunction is a bad thing. But having poor posture as a cyclist makes you more aerodynamic. It's good for you. You know, some of the best deadlifters in the world can't touch their toes because when they take hold of the bar, they are own, all their muscles are at full stretch, ready to apply as much force as they can uh, to the implement. Okay? Uh, and we see examples of this all the time in sport. We always think that every athlete should have perfect balance and should be in this nice category, and it's just, just not true. Um, dysfunction actually helps with your performance. I tell a story that I was at the, uh, at the which strongman? I was at a strongman competition a few years ago and I got chatting to a guy called Benny Magnuson. I don't know if you've heard of Benny, but he's one of the best deadlifters in the world. He still to this day holds a record in the deadlift. Um, and that's, it's a powerlifting record where he doesn't use straps. Most of you have probably seen Half Thor's 501 kilo deadlift that he did the other week, uh, last week, I think. Uh, well, Ben, in that, uh, uh, Hathor was allowed to use straps on the bar, and Benny wasn't. So he still holds a, a record in, in the deadlift. So, so world class athlete, one of the best deadlifters that's ever been. And I was chatting to him, and someone came up to him and asked him for an autograph. He started signing, and he dropped his pen on the floor. Uh, and watching him pick the pen up, was probably the most painful thing I've ever seen any man endure. He had to go really wide on his feet, hold onto a table, reach, pick it up. Um, uh, but not being super flexible makes him incredible at deadlifting. And, and we always assume that flexibility is a good thing, and, and it isn't. I'd argue it's, it's not that uh, important at all. There is zero scientific evidence to, um, to link it to injury prevention. I don't know why people always talk about flexibility being uh, preventative for injury. It's, it's, it's not. <laughs> you need to be flexible enough for your sport. So if you're a gymnast or, or, or a ballet dancer, then obviously you need to be flexible. That is a prerequisite for your sport. But if it's not, then don't worry about it. You don't need to be that flexible. Um, yeah, so I could probably do a whole, a whole uh, webinar on that. When I was when I was writing this, um, I kept having to take stuff out and and add stuff in. And those of you that have already been taught by me before will know that I go on horrendous amounts of tangents. So hopefully I've streamlined it a little bit. Uh, but if you want me to stop and if you've got any questions, please, please, I've I've got the chat box up here. Just ping it in there. And uh, eight o'clock. Yes. Yeah, so. Um, yeah, I, I honestly hadn't thought about that, if I'm honest. Oh, sorry, I've just realised Dave sent me privately. Um, so, yeah, it's the NHS clap at 8 o'clock. I'm probably going to shoot right through, but I will be sending out 
um, the webinar, I'm, I'm recording it. So if you want to go out and, and do that, then then do and, and you can catch up when uh, when I send you the, the link when I upload it to YouTube later. Okay, I probably should have put it on a different night, I didn't think. Uh, so taking a step back and looking at the big picture. Now, I think this is one of the most important lessons I learned as a coach or an aspiring coach. Um, some of the best coaches I've met, and I've met some of you know, the greats in this industry, and I've been incredibly lucky, and, and most of them are so much more experienced than I am, and I'm still in awe of, of their, their presence, um, and I made sure I was at certain seminars so I could talk to the right people. But the best ones I ever met had this amazing ability to step back and look at the whole picture. So it's not just about the session. It's not just about the reps and the sets. They're looking at the whole picture, okay? You know, you look at an Olympic cycle and it's four years long. You know, they're training people for a period of four years uh, to peak for that, that one single event, okay? Um, you go into any gym in the country and, and find a personal trainer um, and ask them, you know, oh, give me an exercise that's good for your butt. And they'll probably give you 50 different exercises. And this is what I've noticed. PTs and coaches, they're great at, at looking at the, the fine details and they'll argue and say, well, this exercise is slightly better for your glutes because of this and that. And I'm not saying that's not true, but some of the really good coaches have this ability to, they don't argue over those tiny, tiny details. They, they look at the picture as a whole and what are the characteristics of the sport that, that need addressing. Um, your needs from your training will change through your life. Um, this is, I think, huge. Uh, there's, there's now a hell of a lot more research on not only youth athletics, but um, research around the elderly and what they need for training. You know, when, when you're young, uh, they've basically scrapped all the stuff that's in the textbook. And I know in the personal training textbooks, it still says children shouldn't lift weights for... Uh, for fear of growth plate fractures well it's not true you know kids are really robust <laughs> if anything they're more like they, they should do weights more than we should um when a kid hits adolescence and, and they start you know a young boy will have so much testosterone in, your, in their system uh a kid at you know 10 years old is, is almost like a, a 30 year old on steroids you know they have like a natural abundance of testosterone it's, it's cheating um and it always makes me laugh that this is the these are the prime years where they should be lifting potentially heavy weights depending on their sport obviously um but we don't we hold them back and we get them doing movement drills and and we there's nothing wrong with kids lifting and, and there's a, a mountain of research out there for this uh, i was very lucky that I, I honestly i tried to search him before this and i couldn't find his stuff but i spent a weekend with a guy who did all the research on youth athletics and, and I, i've been trying to search him because i couldn't remember his name uh, i'll try and find it and message me after but he you know he that was a real eye opener um he was saying not only is lifting weight safe for young adults it's actually so some of the safest things we can do and, and the best things for them. It's uh, running and, and the change of direction and the forces at play in playing sports like football and rugby that damage them. Uh, so it's really funny when you look at the difference of the force that's exerted on your knees and your ankles by football and rugby and, and hockey and those kinds of sports versus lifting weights. If you look at the force exerted, um, it's almost a hilarious comparison that we say like, oh yeah, now go play football in where every step is three times your body weight of force. And then if you run a mile, that's 2000 steps. Um, and then when you add that up to a 10K, what you find is a, a 70 kilo guy is probably gonna have to absorb over a million kilos of force through his Achilles tendon. Um, and that's why runners have such high injury rates. And I'm not saying don't run. I'm just saying you should be um, properly adapted before you, before you do that. And then we say to kids, but you can't lift weights. You know, you can do that thing where you have to deal with a million kilos of force, but lifting weights is wrong. Um, again, I could go on a full tangent with that, but I'll probably leave it, leave it there. Uh, I do know one of the reasons we did so well in the last Olympics is because we changed our uh, 
uh, process of selecting athletes. I don't know if anyone's ever noticed this just from an observational perspective, but uh, the kids that that absolutely smash it as, as a real youngster, as an eight, nine-year-old, are nearly never the, um, uh, the world champions. Uh, I saw it I, when I raced motocross. The kid that was coming up that everyone was like, he's the next big thing. They would, they would like barely make it pro. Um, and that's for many different reasons. One of them is development age. We all develop differently. Um, I, was, I was an early developer. So at, at 12 years old, I had the body of nearly a full grown man. So me playing rugby was like, give the ball to Luke. And I just kind of, just kind of lumbered through pushing people out the way. Uh, two years later, all the, all the, uh, all the the late developers kind of caught up to me and I was kind of like, oh shit, sorry. Didn't mean to punch you in the face last year, you know. Um, and then because kids, but we put them in, in their chronological age, don't we? we? We have under 12s, under 13s. So what happens in rugby, for example, they just give the ball to the big kid and watch him plow everyone over. Um, I know for a fact that was George, who's currently watching this webinar. Um, but that's it's not a very, you don't learn the sport that way they only learn how they just learn to give the ball to the big kid and that's it so what they're doing now in rugby is really cool they're actually calculating roughly how fast one is on the, in their development so you might have kids of 12 years old playing with kids that are like 14 15 but that's fine because the 12 year olds are early developers so they're big for their age and the 14 year old year old is early uh, is, is a, uh, a late developer so they're actually they might be different in chronological age, but they're the same in development years. Um, the other thing, of course, is an you know an eleven year old is is ten percent older than a ten year old. So uh, it's really interesting how we look at uh, youth athletics. Um, and then when we move through our life, when we get older, uh, I think I think our training should should come back to. I still I always think strength is is the best thing to have a base of uh, for any sport you do. So we we've looked at you know youth athletics and why that's important. But in the elderly, they did a, a study back in, in it was in Australia in about 2016 2017, and that was with the elderly lifting weights. And and I tell you what, even when you look at the videos, the, their form is horrendous. You've got these like 70 year old people doing doing deadlifts, and it looks awful. Like I I wouldn't let them deadlift like that. But even with that as a factor, they had so they had two groups: one doing a weight like weightlifting type exercises, one doing long, steady state cardio. And they found that the the group that were lifting weights not only uh, had increases in bone density and muscle mass, like you would expect, their heart health was better, and they had better cholesterol, which. You know, that is the total opposite to what my personal training course taught me. Um, they had better heart health than the group of, of elderly people that were doing long distance running. Really, really cool stuff. Um, I, I honestly, I'll try and find the paper if anyone's interested. It was quite a while ago I read it, but uh, I, I, can, I can do some research and try and find that if, if need be. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, different. I think I think definitely different parts of of your life oh we've got a chat um yeah so changing well okay so oh it's to everyone so um i don't know if you can if the chat box is being recorded on this or not so i'll, I'll talk it out so uh, vj wants to know the comment uh, about selection for the olympics was it just development age uh partly but no it was it was more like uh taking measurements of them and, and predicting how they would grow up rather than just selecting the best kid at the time because uh, what they noticed is if you, well, for any of you that are around sports you, you'll see that the kid that you think is going to be the, the best well yeah it was, it was about development age as well because just looking at the kid that's smashing everything because they're eight years old uh, well you know say that say they were born in um, September and they were the eldest in their year and they're 11 and they're competing against someone who's in the same school year but was born in August. So they're actually, they're a year older, you know, and if one guy's 11 and one guy's 10, he's 10% he's older, you know, because they've only lived for 10 years. So that's why most professional athletes were born in September, October and November, because they were, you know, 
they developed quicker because they were older than their peers and then their confidence level skyrocketed because they were always the best and then they continued with that mindset through but um the kid in in august could have been twice the athlete but they were they were younger you know you were basically putting someone who was 10 percent younger in the same category um so they did all, all sorts of measurements and, and that kind of testing rather than uh uh, just looking at who was the best and selecting them. And we came third to two, it was, was third, wasn't it? I didn't get that wrong. Someone correct me if I did. Uh, but we were, we were battling with some really big countries that, that when you look at population size, we weren't the best when you looked at population size, but we were, we were t seriously up there. We were doing really well. I still maintain we have some of the best weightlifting coaches in the world. The problem is with weightlifting, China love it, and they have people like you wouldn't believe they have a huge population so it's like train them to destruction and then when they destruct it's like right okay well he went so he broke his leg so next one right your turn um and and that's what the countries with the populations do and we can't do that because we don't have as many people and i, I genuinely think we have some of the best weightlifting coaches in the world but i think they're under recognized and underappreciated um Anyway, different parts of the year lend themselves to different types of training. Um, definitely, I mean, your sport, you're going to know your season. I, I don't. I'll show you some of my um, programs later. So motocross was the first sport I worked in. Um, the season runs, it's a really long season. It runs from like March to uh, like October time. So you've got to be good doing various events through that time um so you can't spend a long time working on strength because you're losing these other qualities you need whereas something like a like a boxing match uh, like i've trained jack for a boxing match we basically just train up to uh, you know we put the program in place and it's only one event so everything just kind of peaks and everything builds and it's almost like a like a like a pyramid everything's coming up to that point and then that's our event um some sports you can do that because you only compete, you know, a couple of times a year, like boxing. You don't fight that often. Uh, football basically doesn't have an off season, so you don't really get a chance to to do that. But generally, I find winter works better for lifting weights. In summer, it's nice to go outside and and do some kind of cardio and metabolic conditioning. Um, it's my general thought process. Um, and I've already talked about different parts of your life lend themselves to different types of training. The other thing I want to talk about is elderly. Uh, well, I've already talked about the elderly, but another part of the, uh, training the elderly is uh, groundwork. And I don't think this is just with the elderly. I think this is with everyone up to older age. Um, I don't know if you know the statistic, but statistically speaking, uh, a fall is more deadly than cancer after the age of 50. Uh, there are, we see it all the time, health, health deteriorates and you can trace it back to a fall that they had um, and, and that's where their health problem started. So, you know, even, even people in their 20s and 30s, I don't start doing it in their 50s. I want them to have had that quality. So I get them, you know, my clients hate it. I get them to bear crawl up and down the room. And if you've not done a bear crawl in like a circuit, it's hard. So I would pair like a squat. And then as soon as they've done the squat, they go and do a bear crawl or, or, or whatever, um, or rolling around on the floor. And, and some people don't like doing it. They think it feels a bit silly. So for those, I sneak it in. What I do is I go, right, I want you to do 10 back squats and then 10 press ups. And I don't really care about the press ups. In fact, sometimes I'm like, do as many press ups as you can. And they feel like, especially if they're a guy, they feel tough because they're doing press ups. Really, what I care about is them getting up and down off the floor uh, in many different positions. So I might do a circuit and every other station they have to do a press up. So it's like, I right, do some squats, now press up. Right, do some lunges, now press up. Right, do this, now press up. And I don't really care about how many press ups they do i just care about the fact that they're lying down and standing back up because statistically speaking that will that will save your life um and there was, there was a study out of japan that was really cool where they they put cameras in in elderly people's homes and they found that if their if their gait so their step reduced by five millimeter oh wait, five centimeters sorry which isn't a lot um so if they started stepping because what happens is when you start having balance issues you you stop, stop taking as big a strides uh, to try and balance yourself. But then you, 
you get off balance, okay? And what they found is if, you, if your gait reduced by five centimeters, there is a, unless we intervene, there is a 100% chance you will fall in the next three weeks. 100% chance, will fall. And then when we look at the fact that a fall is one of the most deadliest things that can happen to an over, someone in their over 50, statistically, um, that's quite worrying. Um, so in my training, it's, it's up and down, off the floor. We do a little drill with people and, and they try it. It's actually tougher than you think. I get people to lie on the front and stand up and then on the back and then stand up and then lie on the left side, stand up, lie on the right side, stand up. And then I get them to put their right hand on their right knee and then do the same again. And then left hand, left knee. And then I go right hand, left knee, left hand, right knee. And, uh, and all sorts, just getting them up and down off the floor in, in various different, different ways. Um, and it, it really is, it really is life saving. So, um, spinning plates, uh, and this is a great analogy, I think, for what we're talking about. Um, so we, we've talked about all these different characteristics. You've got endurance, you've got uh, speed, you've got uh, power, you've got strength, um, coordination, agility. We've got all these different things that every athlete, to an extent, needs. I think every athlete needs an amount of strength, obviously depending on the athlete is going to depend on how much. Um, every athlete needs an amount of endurance, but some of them we're going to need uh, at varying levels. And um, uh, we need to spin those plates. And, it, and it's, it's not always that we, we focus on strength or power or whatever it is and, and nothing else. It's, uh, it's that we work on everything and we're keeping all those plates going, but it might be that at this moment in time, we need to spin the plate of strength a little bit harder than the others, okay? Um, again, it does depend on the athlete, so I, I can't gear this to all of your sports, but hopefully you've got something to take home from it. Um, but yeah, we need to keep those plates spinning and let me just move this around so I can see that. Um, we need to keep all those characteristics going. And, and at certain points of the year, um, we need to turn up some, you know, we need to turn up the, the intensity on strength and we need to spin that plate a little bit harder. And then at other times, we just let it go, you know. I'll, I'll take you through some, some examples in a little while. So do you need to peak for a particular event like boxing? You know, we all, it's all up to one event and, it, and it's just that one event. Um, or do you need to be good like a, for a series of events? When I train the sprinters, um, we would do that kind of linear periodization, but then once they hit the in-season, and we did this for the motocrosses as well, they would, they would jump onto an in-season program that would, we, we'd be doing, a, it's a little bit of a jack of all trades. You can kind of, you can build everything at once, but not as well as if you just focus on one. Now in the in-season, we need to keep everything uh, just kind of there. So in the in-season, I'm aware we're not making progress in any of those characteristics, but they're not dropping either. And in the off season, we can be like, right, this six week is this, yeah, this block of six weeks is dedicated to strength training. This block is dedicated to increasing power output. This block, you know, that, that kind of thing. Uh, and then in the, if, if we've got to be good for a series of events, that doesn't work. Cause if you're, looking at strength you might lose endurance um so we'd have an in-season program that, that we just keep everything ticking over uh until we got to the off season and then and then we'd focus on one thing at a time um so you know which events are more important to you so uh, like i said in the motocross one um some events you know motocrossers will compete every weekend and, and they will all tell me that every race is important um but really it, it, motocross is a bit like boxing um how you've got all these different federations there is one overarching british championship but there's also like another organization and they're british masters and then there's like the national championships of motocross and and all of this and every athlete wants to win them all but i used to be like right well which is most important which one do you really want to win because um i need to give you a bit of an off like a down week when we're going into a competition and if you want to win all of these, every week's going to be a down week and I need to know which events you want to, want to be good at. Uh, and then what that means is if there's an event that's not as important to you, you, you train really hard up to it and you know that going into it, you're not at your best, but that's going to be better for your long-term adaptation than, than tapering every single time you've got an event. You need to decide which events you want to be good for. 
Um, you can't be can't be good for all of them. You, you're human like the rest of us. Um, so you know which characteristics are most important to you. Um, okay, now so here is a, a an example of a. It should be twelve weeks. Uh, I seem to have missed a week. Can't count to twelve. Eleven's my my number. Maybe 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 it was there and it was chopped off. Um, uh, maybe it was cut off when I when I transferred it over, but this is my my twelve week um, program for for Jack, my boxer. Um, so what we do basically is we we look at the what is uh, one going to stay with you for longer. So what you what you generally find is strength stays with you for quite a long time. You can go months without training strength. And, and not really lose too much, or if you do lose a bit, you get it back pretty quickly. Whereas there's some things you lose, and, and a, you know, cardio is a bit different. Um, getting back some some uh, power is difficult. We tend to lose power as we get older, so being explosive is something that's harder to gain back. So um, we, we make sure that's programmed in. So the first thing I do is strength uh, for the boxing. You know, for some some. You know, I'd probably flip this if it was a power lifter or something, but for a boxer, strength to be bar bendingly strong is, is not that easy to be a boxer. You do need some strength. Um, I think people, they like to, when they think of strength, they think of big bodybuilders. I'm not, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about creating maximal force through the muscles. And if you think about it, being stronger makes you more endurance. So I spend most of my life just trying to tell people that strength is good, even for endurance athletes. You might think like, oh, I want to run a marathon. Strength's got nothing to do with me. It has, it, and max speed has as well. So I just say, you know, if, if you're running a marathon, or let's say we've got two, uh, no, that's a bad example. I'll use that example after, for strength. Um, if you increase your maximum, so if we take your squat, let's say you're squatting, um, 100 kilos okay and I take your squat we work on strength and we take it from 100 kilos to 150 kilos okay we've now added 50 percent onto your maximum strength now if I were to put 80 kilos on your back uh, and get you to squat it you would uh, for as many reps as you can you would be able to perform more reps if your one rep max was 150 kilos versus if your max was 100 kilos so you've become more endurant, right? So when you're when you, the maximum force you can exert is increased, um, the sub-maximal stuff becomes easier. And this is the same when I talk to marathon runners, and they're like, I don't need to do max speed sprints. I'm a marathon runner. I run for three hours. I'm like, well, well hold on. If we had two, I use this example. I say, if we have two footballers, okay? They're both, I'm not as good at maths. I know George is in there. He's going to be laughing at me. Um, and they're both running eight meters per second, okay? They're running for the ball eight meters per second. One of them, their max speed that they can produce is 10 meters per second. He's running at 80% uh, of his max speed. The other guy, his max speed is 11 or 12 meters per second. It's pretty quick actually, but <laughs> um, uh, 11 or 12. So even though they're both running at eight meters per second, the guy with the higher max speed is going to uh, take longer to wear out because he's, he's running at a lower percentage uh, of his maximum. Um, and this is why I try and drill it in people's heads. They're like, I don't need max strength. I don't need max speed. I'm an endurance athlete. I'm like, you, you absolutely do. Granted, endurance is a bigger factor in, in you know, marathon running and, and uh, well, cardiovascular endurance uh, in marathon running and in um you know endurance sports i will give you that your endurance is very important um but your max speed and your strength is also very important probably more so than you think you would and it's interesting if we got you to do that that analysis at the start when you ticked i bet for some of you, you ticked endurance over strength after hearing that i wonder i wonder who would flip those um there are a few that i would i would uh, i would argue strength is is more important for that particular sport for that reason, it, it still makes you more endurance. So uh, we start with a general prep phase. So if you look at the periods that we've got there, we've got general prep, specific prep, and competition phase. 
uh, general preparation is like general strength, uh, you know, very general skill sets working on squatting, pressing. And a study by Bomper and Half actually found that athletes with that were better at the general stuff and worked on the specific stuff less were better, especially in youth athletics. They found that going specific too early, while it seems like a good idea, and I, I do understand the thought process, but for whatever reason, they found that the athletes that, that picked up a, the, the young athletes that picked up a good general preparation base uh, were the ones that performed much better. Uh, I do have one of Bumper and Half's books here. If you're someone that likes tables and likes data, and I used it to reference some of this, this thing is, is real heavy reading, but if you're a super nerd like me, um, you know, it's all, look how small that writing is. Ooh, lots of graphs and stuff, that. that's cool. Um, anyway, Bumper and Half, the, this one's just called Periodization. They do a few books um, and they're all good. Uh, yeah, and anything that Bumper and Half do about periodization is, is phenomenal. Um, so yeah, they found that, that working on the general preparation first, just it's just better. It's better to have that uh, uh, general skill set and then you can apply it to many different things. And they definitely found at youth athletics, getting too specific too soon uh, is a mistake, they found. But you know, it would seem like the right thing to do, right? Um, Anyway, so we start with, with, so this is five weeks of general preparation. Then we get to more specific preparation. And finally, uh, we're into the competition phase where everything's really geared around the, the sport. General prep, we look at strength. Um, so this here, this is what we call a, a macro cycle. I'm going to talk about these later. A macro cycle is like a big block of training. Sometimes it can, this is, this is tiny, this is 12 weeks. Some of the macro cycle can be, you know, years, and that's made up of what we call mesocycles. Um, you know, think about like nutrition. We've got macronutrients and micronutrients. And macro is always the big one. So um, we, our mesocycle is strength. We did that for three weeks. And then I've actually, although I put it in this slide, because it's just because I know people don't understand it, I've stopped using the term power. Um, and I've started using terms like strength speed and speed strength and speed. So if you want to Google it, it's, it's quite cool. It's called the, I was going to put it in here, but I, I didn't amend it in the end, but it's called the force velocity curve. And it's a curve where we talk about, um, I've had uh, George that's in there, he's an he's a, uh, engineer. He's, he told me that I'm using the word velocity wrong, but he can lecture me later. This is, <laughs> uh, so on one side, we've got force. Well, let's translate force to strength, okay? And then um, you've got velocity and, and we'll, we'll change that for speed. Okay, so strength speed. On one end of our strengths on this spectrum, we've got heavy strength work, like a, like a big one rep max deadlift, like a really heavy deadlift. And on the other end, we've got pure speed, something like plyometrics, uh, sprinting, real fast stuff. Okay, now for your untrained individual, doing any of that will make you better at the other. And, and this is, I don't want to sound rude here, but I, I come across lots of beginners that think they know it all. And they're like, well, I did this and it worked for me. And I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit like, well, yeah, um, I don't want to tell you this, but you're a total novice. You know, I, I, and I was a total novice for a long time and, and I'm probably only intermediate now. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, but people always think they're a little bit higher along than they are. And I, I don't want this to sound rude, but in my head, if you're not squatting twice your body weight, um, in terms of weightlifting, I still consider you quite a beginner. Um, and I really don't mean that with any offense. If anything, knowing that means that you can do the training that works better for you. So a novice, anything on there will work. You know, it's, it's low hanging fruit. Um, Dan John has a phrase. He says that one guy came into his gym and quite a large overweight chap and he just said to him, hey, have you tried drinking a glass of water a day and with no with one glass of water a day the guy dropped pounds or maybe no i apologize got that wrong he said uh, a sip of water every time you drink a coffee and the guy dropped a hell of a load of weight and he's like well it's low-hanging fruit i could have put him on on a keto diet or, on, or intermittent fasting or any of these things but 
this guy's never walked in a gym in his life. A, a sip of water has, has changed his life. Um, so really anything you do on this, on this strength to speed is going to work. But as we get more, uh, more experience, we need to start getting more specific. So on one side, we've got heavy deadlifts. On the next, we've got speed. If we move inwards towards the speed, we've probably got, you know, like a clean. Um, it's, it's still a heavy strength exercise, but there is a very powerful element to it. You have to explode the bar up to your shoulders and, and catch it, okay? If we move even further, we've probably got the snatch. So the clean I would class as like a strength speed. Um, I call it strength speed. So it's strength with some speed elements in it. And then we've got speed strength. So that would be like a snatch, you know, like straight up over your head. Sorry, the weight you can use in a snatch is going to be a lot less than you can use in the clean. Uh, so it's a more speed element. It's got more of a speed element to it, um, but it's not pure speed yet. Okay, there's a strength element to it. And then we've got raw speed, so sprinting, all of that. And then, and then we call it, there's like a, there's a graph and then there's a curve and we call it the, the force velocity curve. And depending on your sport, it's going to depend on where you want to train. Um, so strength is like the real high force stuff, just deadlifts and bench press and overhead press and, you know, that kind of stuff. Strength speed is like cleans and there's an explosive element to it. Uh, it could be, if, if you're not, if your Olympic lifting capability isn't, efficient which for many of us it isn't it takes years and years to get good at olympic weightlifting but strength speed could be like a squat jump okay bar on your back put some weight down on it hold it down so, because the worst thing with a squat jump is it comes up and gets you and then you jump with with some load um and then speed strength could be instead of a depth jump kind of doing like rebound jumps so you're not dropping right the way into the squat it's just a, a quick rebound that kind of thing and then speed would be pure plyometric Hopefully that, that kind of makes sense uh, somewhat. So we're getting this from, so what I'm doing here is from the program from week one where it's really heavy strength going, we're taking, we're kind of working on the slow heavy stuff and then working up to the fast explosive stuff, which is the, it, it's the most, it, it's the quality that we need the most for the event. A boxer needs to be fast. Um, so we, we, that's the last thing we do. Okay. Uh, there's no point flipping that because we'd be going to the fire having just come off a strength cycle and being really slow and lumbering and you know not that quick so it's the quality that we need the least but we still need it building up to the quality we need the most um i've got i've got meso rt which is my, me, the meso cycle for resistance training and then we've got the, the meso cv so the, the cardiovascular meso cycle LSS is, um, stands for long steady state cardio. Uh, some people call it LSD, but I, I don't really want to tell my athletes to do LSD. Some of them aren't that bright. They probably will get that wrong. Um, and so anyway, long steady state stuff is like your long run. So for that, you'd be going out running for an hour, cycling for an hour. Uh, I'd probably put a heart rate cap on it. So I, depending on age, so it, it does change per person. But for Jack there, uh, he's in his early 20s. I'd tell him not to go over uh, 160 beats per minute. So it's about uh, keeping the intensity low and the volume high. Uh, and that's because he needs to finish the fight, you know? He needs to have that, that base level of endurance. So you can see how this is working on this base and it's coming up to a peak we're going from a big base of kind of uh, long steady state stuff general preparation up to a, a very specific um kind of peak so we start with that kind of long steady state um and and he does need that and most athletes need that i'd even argue there was a period of time especially when i was started coaching where people said don't bother with endurance bases you don't need an endurance base just work on what's specific and then people start gassing out, you know. Um, an endurance base is an interesting one because working on your specific stuff does help. But if you have a good aerobic base, then you can do more of the explosive stuff later on. I hope that makes sense. So it means that later on when I'm getting him to do short sprints, he's got the work capacity to do more short sprints, which in the long term will help him that makes sense kind of makes sense in my head if it doesn't please send me a send me a message uh then we work on long intervals uh medium intervals and then we finally go for short sprints and again a boxing match is uh, is a is a shorter event you know 
depending on, on he is professional but at the minute he's only doing six rounds which is horrendous but a couple of minutes at a time uh it, it's real high intensity and uh, there's something quite different about having someone around punch you in the head it makes any sport a lot harder um yeah so hopefully that that makes a little bit of sense oh and then taper is like like cooling down um uh, doing some um uh you know, mobility work, just, just cool him off a little bit. Uh, we taper the strength stuff first, uh, cause you don't really lose that. And then, and then we taper down from the cardio stuff. Um, generally speaking, uh, long distance stuff takes longer to adapt to than short sprinting stuff, which is why we do the short sprinting stuff last. Cause you can, from one week to the next, if you work on your short sprints and you, you test and you should be, I probably didn't mention this, but you probably should, well, you definitely should be testing different qualities. And there are a hundred ways to test. We, I mean, I test lung capacity and, you know, one rep max testing or specific to the athlete. Um, uh, there's, there's, there's uh, long jumps and high jumps. We can test. Uh, I've got a, a, a hand dynamometer so I can test how strong your grip is and see if one hand is stronger than the other. Um, we can, I've got a little, uh, uh, what's it called, a spirometer so I can test lung function. Um, so if you do any, any test, what you'll find is from a, one week to the next, you'll, you'll get a much quicker adaptation for short uh, sprints than you can long sprints. Um, I, I, I'm going on a bit of a tangent now, I know, but I find the industry does these cycles all the time. Like, oh, there was a big running boom in the 70s and everyone should go running. And then now it's HIIT training and everyone should do HIIT training. And you know what? I, what they found is long, steady state stuff, uh, you keep adapting for longer. So you have, to, you have to spend a good amount of time doing it and you just keep adapting. Whereas HIIT training you adapt and plateau really quickly. So in a, in a three week block and you were like, right, I've got three weeks to get really fit. What do I do? Oh, well, loads of hit training. But if you said, look, I've got a competition next year, what should I do? Uh, and then long steady state, it'll keep, it'll keep adapting. Whereas it's why people love hit training. What they do is they do it for three weeks and they get this absolute, like the fitter than they ever were in a very short period of time. And then they plateau. Um, but the problem is they remember how good, how quick that learning curve was. So they just keep doing it. Whereas what they need to do is change up the stimulus. Um, so I don't think hits good or bad. I don't think long steady state's good or bad. Um, I think it's about where you place them. And that's what periodization is about. It's about putting things in the right place at the right time. Uh, when people are like, oh, look, hit training is a new big thing. What do you think about it? I'm like, it's, it's got its place. Uh, but you definitely shouldn't be doing it every single session. You know, you should do it for a, a block, a, a, a meso cycle, and then you should move on to something else because you've got to keep driving the adaptation. And I know people that every day, every week, week in, week out, they do three sets of 10, Monday's chest day, Tuesday's back and buys, they have Wednesday off, Thursday's legs, but let's be honest, for most guys, it's probably back and buys again. Uh, Friday's bench again and then, and then they go out drinking on the weekend and they've done three sets of 10 for the last 10 years and they adapted they've finished adapting 10 years ago you know nine years and, and, and 10 months they, they've not been adapting to it at all they've just been maintaining um, so I don't think one one way of training is better than another I think it's uh, knowing that short short hit training is going to give me a, a very quick learning curve, I put that in last because I know three weeks up to the competition, I can still be driving an adaptation. There. Sorry, a bit of a tangent. Whew. So, off season, uh, these are 400 meter sprinters. Uh, this is going to be riddled with. I typed it up really quickly. It's going to be riddled with spelling mistakes and grammar issues. So point bonus points if you find those uh, uh, this is quite cool i started playing around with uh, and actually there is some research in this again I, I can't remember the guy's name he was on a he was on the power athlete podcast last year and I'll, I'll, I'll try and find him and they were talking about i've known it for a little while but um it hasn't something i've it hasn't been something i've really played with like playing with eccentric and concentric strength okay so i talked about it earlier the eccentric is the lowering phase um now what i what i started playing with is 
loading the eccentric more than the concentric. So I've got these uh, at the gym, they're really cool, and then we only let some people play with them because the, the injury risk without being uh, uh, quite uh, an experienced lifter is quite high. So I really only kind of the more experienced guys can use them, but they're kind of hooks, and they'll hook onto the bar, and they've got weights on the bottom, and the bottom is, is kind of tilted. And when they hit the floor, they flick off the bar. So what happens is you've got a really heavy weight. You've got a lower with a really heavy weight. And when you hit the bottom, they flick off and the weight suddenly becomes light and you can fire back up. If that makes sense. So what I was doing was putting about 105, 110% of someone's one rep max. So this is more weight than they can actually lift. And they're, they're just feeling the weight and they're lowering down with a heavier weight than they can actually lift. They hit the bottom the weight releases flick off and then they fire up with 70%. So I have 70% on the bar and then with everything else, it's about 105%. Now, eccentrics, that's, that would be eccentric training with loading up the eccentric phase, the lowering phase. Um, now that's not the first phase you'll notice. I've got isometric first. And the, the reason for that is the injury rate here is really high because they've got more weight on them than they can, than they can physically lift. The reward is, is, Oh, we've got a question. The reward is also there. Um, George just saying that uh, eccentric weights are great. That is that is very true. They are great. Um, George is a pretty pretty strong. I'm not sure what I'd call him now. Strongman, powerlifter, just overall big strong guy. Um, so if you do the the eccentric stuff, there's a very high injury rate. Uh, so what I do is I do isometrics first. And um, I always get I always get crap for this. I, I do I, I happily do isometrics with people. So that isometric is when the muscles generating force but not creating any movement. So things like doing quarter squats. I think doing quarter squats, not you know, just getting people from just slightly bending their knees and not doing full squats, but with a really heavy weight. And what you find is if you do that stuff to get them used to feeling the heavy load on the back, then when you move to the eccentric stuff, uh, their injury rate becomes lower. So it's, you, you don't, I, I don't have any research to back that up. That's just pure, um, I don't know, not, not instinct, but, but uh, experience and, and just working in the trenches and doing it. So I do the isometric stuff first, real heavy weights, but obviously depending on the person, more than they could do a full squat with, but just quarter squats. Um, last time I put that on Instagram, I, I got loads of messages. That's not a real squat. You just squat parallel. <laughs> yeah, but we're doing it for a reason because if you do a quarter, if your one rep max is uh, 200 kilos and you do a quarter squat with 210, 220, all of a sudden 200 kilos doesn't feel that much. And for those of you that have experienced in lifting weights, the thing I notice is when you put a one rep max squat on your back, the first thing you feel is like, wow, that's crushing me. <laughs> uh, so if we can get that away and, and it feels, you know, doesn't feel too heavy, that's a good thing. So it's just getting used to, to having heavier loads. So isometric first, then eccentric. So we're loading up the down phase and then exploding up with a light weight. And then we did a little bit of hypertrophy. These were young athletes. They were at the time of their life where I think they should have been working on a little bit of hypertrophy. They should have been working on um, some strength. Just looking at, uh, oh, I've lost my mouse. There it is. I think if I just move it around, it comes back. <laughs> um, sorry, these were in the kind of mid-teens. They were in that phase where, what, where they really needed to pack on a little bit of muscle. Um, I probably wouldn't put a hypertrophy phase in if, if they were older, if they were in their 20s. Uh, that's quite old in sprinter land. Uh, then we worked on strength speed. This is the same as Jack stuff. And then speed, strength, and then pure speed. And this was off season. So once we hit in season at week 18, um, they didn't see me again until the next season because, again, the, the plates they needed to be spinning was strength in the off season. But once we hit in season, we don't want to be doing that strength stuff. So it's kind of like being a strength and conditioning coach is not only about um, uh, it's going to sound daft. It's about knowing when you're not needed. You know, many people, they know how to make people stronger. They're a strength and conditioning coach. My job is to make people stronger. And they've got a hammer. They're the hammer. And everything's a nail. And everyone needs to get stronger. But I think the skill is to, is for me at week 18, you know, you know, I was in this one, I was in very close contact. And this was probably some of the best sports coaches I've ever dealt with was the, the sprinters because 
the sports coach, the sprint coaches, the track and field coaches would come to the strength and conditioning session. I've never had that before. Nine times out of 10, their sports conditioning coach thinks I'm an idiot. Um, definitely in boxing, boxers think that you can just do a million press ups, a million sit ups, good to go. There you go, get in the ring and punch someone. Um, so they think I'm an idiot. They think their athlete shouldn't be coming to me, but their athlete likes what I'm doing. So he keeps coming and they don't speak to me. <laughs> um, so it was really nice to, to deal with these sprinters and where me and the, the coaches would come to the session. We, we brief each other. They'd say, right on the track, we're doing this. What can you do to complement that? And I'd say we're doing, and that was probably one of the best working relationships I've ever had with a, um, with a sports coach. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm very good friends with Grant and the guys. So, uh, and I'll be sending him this later. So you'll see it. Thanks for that, mate. Um, where were we? And yeah, and then, then we take them into the competition and then I kind of hand them off. Then after that, the in season program wasn't dealt with me. That was uh, another group of, of fantastic people that I got the, got the privilege of standing on the shoulders of um, some real giants, which is great. Uh, anyway, so isometric strength, eccentric strength, hypertrophy. Then we worked on strength speed, so a lot of Olympic weightlifting, um, speed strength. So turning that speed into, uh, sorry, speed strength, and then it's like the lighter Olympic lifting. So in the strength speed, it's like lots of high pulls and squat jumps. In the speed strength, it's like snatch variations and things that are faster, but with a bit of a weight element. You don't have to do Olympic lifting. I just, I think I'm good at coaching Olympic lifting, if I do say so myself. Um, so I use it, but I know many coaches that don't feel confident enough to demo it and don't feel confident enough teaching it. And you can get the similar element without you get a similar training effect without it you don't have you know you can do like squat jumps and other things and then we worked on speed and that was lots of heavy plyometric speed and velocity and, and working on real explosive stuff uh plyometrics for those that don't know and it's a bit of a bit of a bugbear of mine a lot of people in the industry don't quite understand what plyometrics is plyometrics i'm going to super simplify it you can do full workshops on this uh it's about landing and exploding off again uh very quickly and it's about when your foot hits the floor as if, if it happens in in 0.3 of a second or less so if your foot is in contact with the floor for less than 0.3 of a second, it's not plyometric anymore. So the most plyometric thing you can do is sprinting. And then what happens is because of the speed, the entire calf muscle takes the quality of the tendon and you just get this elastic bound effect. So that's what sprinting is, isn't it? Your foot hits the floor and you're not purposely contracting and pushing your toes up. It's just happening like a spring, like really quickly. Um, but you get people doing box jumps, and being like, oh, I'm doing plyometrics. And you're like, actually, a box jump is not a plyometric exercise because you start from a, you don't, there's no rebound. You just jump up and then step off. Um, and I think the box jump is a fantastic, it's a fantastic power exercise, but it's not plyometric. Plyometric would be if you jumped off one box, bounced and onto another. That would be, that would be plyometric. And again, uh, very high injury risk. So it's almost good that most personal trainers don't know what plyometrics is because they probably injure all their clients. Um, very high injury risk in plyometrics. You can have up to eight to 10 times your body weight and force with each step. So you've got to make sure that your athlete is strong, competent, has good movement patterns before you start doing that plyometrics. And really, in an ideal world, every athlete that did plyometrics should be squatting uh, at least twice their body weight, which is a lot. Um, is change of direction uh, plyometrics? Yes, yes, if it's quick enough. If it's 0.3 of a second or less, then yes, it will be plyometric um, in nature. And we should be doing that, that change of direction stuff because if we always do plyometrics in a, in a straight line, uh, then we only get good at it in a straight line. Now I train sprinters, so how much change of direction does a sprinter need? None, nothing. They run in a straight line, literally. Slight left turn if they're a 400 meter runner, and that's it. Um, so they don't need it. But yeah, it's actually one of the reasons some sprinters tried to try it out for the NFL. And, and while they smashed all the uh, straight line sprinting stuff, as soon as it, it came to dodging dodging the competition, they just get wiped out. Uh, so they, they sometimes, well, a lot of the time, they struggle because they, running is one thing, but stopping is another. And being good at football, rugby, hockey, 
Uh, you've got to be able to stop as well as you can. So deceleration is as important as acceleration. In fact, I w I'd go as far to say that deceleration is more important, not because it's actually more important, but because nobody does it. And because nobody does it, the balance is off. They're not doing enough of it. So it's not more important but for that reason. It, it, it is stopping is as as you know is more important than an acceleration deceleration is just as important and uh deceleration is eccentric loading so uh you're starting to see why why putting an eccentric phase in there is a, a good idea if you ran down a hill it would it would all be trying to slow down trying to stop you wouldn't be trying to speed up you'd spend your whole time trying not to, if this, the hill was steep enough trying not to uh, uh to go too quick and kill yourself um so even if i've got a little slide here and this was just a quick thing i threw up it's like some of you might not be sports people you might have come on here to see how to plan your specific exercise session and that's that's great uh, more power to you i, I think it's uh, great so i just knocked something up six week program um you know even if your goal is not sports specific and you just want to get better leaner uh even if your goal is body composition you want abs and you want to look good on the beach well, if you just keep driving home the same rep scheme every week, the adaptation is going to stop and you're going to plateau. And like I said, people do HIIT training. And because they saw an increase at the start, they think if they keep nailing it and keep doing it, they're going to get that increase again at some point. And it never comes. We need to be changing up the stimulus. So, you know, here's one, you know, hypertrophy, so muscle building for two weeks, strength for two weeks, and then power. I haven't even bothered breaking down into strength, speed, and speed strength. I think for most people, power's fine. And then cardio, long distance, medium, and short. So it doesn't have to be groundbreaking. It doesn't have to get super complicated. In fact, I, uh, I went from uh, Dan John, uh, absolute hero of mine. He probably doesn't even remember this because he does so many seminars. But, uh, you know, about eight years ago, I went to one of his seminars and went for some food after and uh, i got some great words of wisdom and, and one of them was uh, uh he's like your program doesn't need to be perfect everyone keeps trying to invent perfect programs but there is no perfect program the difference is it's about having the program that's right for you so there is no perfect program and if you write a program that's that's pretty good and, and okay that's that's good enough am i the two i showed you amazing programs oh no, <laughs> some people show me their programs and I can't even follow it. I'm like, I'm like my brain doesn't compute that quick enough. But I, I wrote myself a program and we stuck to it. And um, well, no, we didn't. That's, that's, a, that's a different conversation. Um, and it was okay. And having a plan in place is better than not having a plan. Now, honestly, have I ever, ever in my life written a program that has been followed to the absolute letter? Not once, not once. Something always happens. They get injured or uh, uh, bless him, Jack who come up to one of his fights, had paralysis in half his face. He got uh, Bell's palsy where your face kind of drops and, and uh, <laughs> we, were, we were doing all sorts. I'm not laughing at the Bell's palsy. I'm, I'm laughing at the fact that he, he did everything he could to still try and fight. And I was like, dude, look, you, your face is paralyzed. Like, yeah, but now I can't feel being punched in the face, so it's, it's going to be great. And I'm like, no, the doctors are never going to never going to allow this. And he was like, well, if we just get it so it looks okay, and then we eventually pulled him out of the fight after. Uh, that was quite funny. Um, so something always pops up, and it might be you get halfway through the program and you think, you know what, this this phase, I, I thought it was going to work better than it is, but we just tested and it didn't work very well. Well, then change it. That's fine. Um, but the point is having the plan in place is better than not having it in place. And don't get stressed out when it doesn't work. Because I think following the plan to the letter is weirdly can be a mistake. I've, I've done programs before where on week, you know, we a 12 week program, we get to week nine and, and um, I'm like, oh, I feel great. I, I want to do a one rep max today. But I'm like, well, you know, uh, the program doesn't call for it today, so we're going to wait until the end of the program. And then you get to the end of the program and you have a bad day. And, and you know, there are things in life we can't plan for, you know. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, ladies' monthly cycles, men also have cycles. It's not as obvious. So there will be parts 
for men and women, there will be parts in the month where you're stronger, there will be parts in the month where you're weaker. Um, the fact is, if you're under emotional stress, that's probably going to affect your performance as well. So sometimes we don't stick to the program. Uh, sometimes it's actually good to go off program, and, and it's actually. But I think the experience is knowing when to, you know, when to go off because you need to, and when to go off just because you feel like it, and you shouldn't just be going off program just because you you feel like it. I think we've got a question here. Hang on. Um, Oh, <laughs> that's a story behind there. So Paul says, or if you have a massage before your one rep max, yes, uh, sports massage before an event will make your performance worse. <laughs> um, Paul, we did a we did a great program. I was very proud of that program, and it came to his uh, his one rep max testing, and and he'd had a massage that morning, and I was like, you know, that's not actually. I, it's probably my fault. I probably should have told him. But I was like, it doesn't actually help. If anything, a massage will. Uh, oh God, I don't want to say break down because we don't massage doesn't actually break down tissue, but um, it, it does actually uh, make it is a detriment to your performance. It's good for your recovery on an off day. So his wife ended up uh, beating him quite significantly on that squat day. I'm sure he doesn't mind me telling that story. I hope. Um, so yeah, some days, some days. Uh, you can go off program and, and I've never written a program that's been followed to the letter. I don't think ever once. Um, it never happens. Um, just to, just to break this up in case you're wondering as well, hypertrophy is, is about muscle building um, and strength is about your actual strength in the muscle. And they are two different things. Again, for a beginner doing one will do the other. So you will get some strength in hypertrophy and you will get some hypertrophy in strength. Um, but we can manipulate the rep scheme. So most programs are hypertrophy. Most, you know, anything that's eight upwards to 12 is, is hypertrophy and then 12 up is, is more endurance. So, uh, but strength training, you know, training strength is a, strength is a, a neurological adaptation. It's, uh, you can, you never, you, your body has an off switch. Um, if you, you know, you hear about these amazing stories of, of, people who, who aren't that physically strong lifting cars off children it's, it's because your body has this off switch and you have amazing untapped potential in your muscles but your body has this off switch to stop you getting injured if it gave you all of your strength in one go you could tear your muscles completely off the bone and actually that happens in strongman competition and things like that because they are so highly refined and i'll explain that in a moment so strength is, is actually not a necessarily a physical uh, trait it's, it's a neurological trait you go to lift something and your body's like ah this is heavy you could hurt yourself I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna turn the switch on and, and let you not let you lift that and then you can't lift it so strength is about teaching that switch that it's okay to give me a little bit more of my potential now some people professionals are so far along there they do tear muscles off completely off boat um, and there's great videos on YouTube. If you've done any of my mass sports massage courses that I teach, I, I show a whole variety of them. It's uh, really gross, but quite quite fun. Um, bicep tears in deadlifts. That's why I hate the over under grip. I think it's horrendous for the deadlift. You see the biceps pop off on the on the on the underhand. It happens all the time. Um, so strength is actually about producing more force, and that's not necessarily about getting bigger. So people think when they think of strength, they think of bodybuilders, but that's not necessarily the case. You know, look at the 69 kilo weightlifters in China. You've got people that are like tiny, well, not that big, but really small people, um, really short, you know, really lean, and, and they're throwing ridiculous weights above their head. Um, I've, got, I've got a friend who's a, who's a weightlifter, and he's a phenomenal athlete. Uh, whereas hypertrophy is about muscle building and actually you know what I'm going to be totally honest we still as an industry don't know a lot about muscle building um, we know that there's different types there's sacroplasmic or um, myofibrillia and, and there are two different types of, of hypertrophy there but we don't know a lot about it and I'm always you know unfortunately our our industry is full of people that think they've at, they think they know it all um, and, and, you know, you show me someone that's figured it all out and I'll show you an idiot. Um, you know, the Dunning-Kruger effect is, is strong in my industry. If you want to Google Dunning-Kruger effect, I would um, highly encourage it. 
So yeah, uh, we still don't know a lot about hypertrophy, but hypertrophy is basically gaining muscle size. The one thing we do know is we're not adding muscle fibers. We used to think that we'd add muscle fibers. We're just making the muscle fibers bigger uh, and everything's just getting bigger, which is sometimes needed in some sports. You know, strongman, for example, doesn't matter whether it's fat or muscle, being heavy helps in some situations. So if you're gonna pull a truck, the heavier you are and you lean forward, um, there we go, you can get it started with your body weight. So being a, an overweight strong man is, is advantageous, you know. Um, uh, it's funny because people say, no, strong men can be super lean. Look at Pudzianowski, and I don't want to be rude, but Pudzianowski was an amazing athlete and he was ripped and he turned up and you know, he, he was supposed to apparently prove that you don't need a, a, a power belly, but just look at the weights they were lifting back then versus now. Um, Pudzianowski wouldn't wouldn't qualify. I'm not sure if I should say that because I'm open on putting this on the internet. So I'm opening myself up to a lot of hate there, but it, but it is true. Yeah, the whole industry's moved on. So anyway, uh, macro cycle. What is it? I'm just going to sum this up. This this is this the textbook stuff. I I I, I wanted to throw it in there because it needs to be in there, but also I didn't want to do a, a webinar about something that you could just find. Uh, on any half decent S and C and personal training course, um, a macro cycle for it can span from twelve weeks to potentially years. You know, um, your um, lost my lost my thought process. Olympic cycles four years long. It's made up of meso cycles, and it's it's the biggest block of training. It's the bigger that that was a macro cycle. What I showed you earlier. Mesocycle is made up of microcycles. It's generally three to six weeks. Uh, and it's the plate that you're currently spinning the hardest at that moment in time. Okay, so if we've got a strength mesocycle, we're probably spinning the, the plate of strength the hardest. That doesn't mean we're forgetting about other things. Uh, it just means that's the one we're, we're spinning the hardest at that moment in time. Uh, I'm just checking my notes because I basically haven't looked at them all evening. Um, micro cycle, micro cycle is what you do week do week per week. It's a week long uh, kind of plan, and it's it's um, made up of individual individual sessions. Okay. Um, oh, I'll, yeah, I'll leave that for a second, but. Uh, yeah, your micro cycles, they, they're your individual kind of sessions through the through the week. Uh, no, they're not, they're not your session, sorry. It's, it's your weekly plan. You know, what you're doing Monday, what you're doing Tuesday, what you're doing Wednesday. Um, generally, what I've shown you is a linear periodization. So we're looking at like building to a peak. But like for motocross, for example, once you're in season, you've got to keep all those plates spinning at the same time. So then we enter a, a non-linear periodization where we're looking at working on every quality all, nearly all the time. Um, now, you don't build on anything significantly, but you're not losing anything either. Because in motocross, there's a lot of different characteristics you need. There's not one overarching thing. You need to be strong enough to muscle a bike around. You need to be cardio efficient because it's, uh, depending on the organization, it can be three 20 minute races in a day. Um, so it's very enduring. Uh, your heart rate's through the roof. So you've got to have some good lactate thresholds. Uh, muscular endurance plays a part. Balance and coordination is all, all uh, uh, needed. So uh, what I would do there is actually what we call a 21 day periodization because trying to fit everything in one week is just like, it's nearly impossible. So it would be every three weeks we would revisit everything. So we'd basically do a, a session or two on everything every uh, every three weeks. And we do that in season, but then off season, it would be more linear. It would be like right now, strength, and get those blocks in. Um, you should be testing the qualities you want to improve. So all out max strength testing, uh, one rep maxing, that kind of thing. Uh, now, interesting one, uh, people get this wrong sometimes. Uh, so how heavy you can squat is, is quite well correlated with uh, sprinting and running and jumping. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that the squat's the best exercise for you though. Really what it means is leg strength is very well correlated with uh, explosive movements, so uh, max testing and strength. So it doesn't have to be barbell back squat. Some people can't barbell back squat. And actually, I'm uh, I'm going to talk about specificity a little bit more in a minute. But let me get through these. So all-out efforts. So I'm uh, I'm 
playing at rowing at the moment. My friend challenged me to do a half marathon tomorrow, which is why I've had today off training. So I'm doing a half marathon row, which I'm not looking forward to because I'm not an insurance guy, but you know, when I get challenged, I really can do it. Um, so that could be, I, I was quite into my indoor rowing. So for me, that would be a 2K row, a 5K row. You know, if you're a marathon runner, what's your best marathon time? You know, testing that. Power output or, you know, jumping high, jumping far. Uh, the lung function that could be either in like a beep test that people use. Uh, there's VO2 max testing. I've got a little spirometer that I get people to blow into. It, it tells me their their, um, their lung capacity and then you know resting heart rate or even body fat if that's needed for your sport. Uh, a little word on specificity. I was going to say it earlier and I, I, I breezed past it. Even certain exercises will sometimes have to be tailored depending on on the person we are all different creatures we, we all have massive differences between us uh if you ever watch a basketballer squat they need to do leg strength work so they do squat but they barely hit parallel they're so bloody tall they're like i can't remember what the statistic is but it's something like if you live in America and you're over seven feet tall, there's something like a one in six chance that you were already uh, in the NBA because uh, they're all so bloody tall. So um, watching a basketballer do a squat, they're not going to hit parallel. And it always makes me laugh that there's that textbook kind of squat, right? Where it's like, ah, oh, feet should be shoulder width and toes should be pointed out 10 to 2. Um, and then you should squat below parallel. Uh, I just... It doesn't work for, for a lot of the population. Brett Contreras does some work where he talks about the glutes and, and he says that not, for nine out of 10 people, turning the feet out activates the glutes more than having them straight forward. Now in your head, you might think, the first thing it's reasonable to think is, well, okay, most people should have their toes out. It's true. But that means for one in 10 people, their toes need to be turned in um, to activate the glutes more. So if we got a room of 100 people, 10 of those people wouldn't get very good glute activation by turning their feet out. Um, so the squat is gonna look very different depending on the person in front of you. Um, some people, and depending on the sport as well, my sprinters barely would hit parallel because what's the range that you need to exert power in as a sprinter? It's not full depth. You don't have to go deep in the squat to be a good sprinter. You just need to have that, that quick rebounding power. So we do, quite shallow squats i i get them to do um full depth squats to warm up because i believe they need the mobility for their life and for other things so they can physically do a depth squat but when we load them up it's actually more beneficial to get more leg strength to get more leg strength we need more load so i'd get them to do quite shallow squats i'd get their feet to be quite narrow and i'd get them to point their toes forward or even in and that's because when you're sprinting you want your toes in because you can push off better um, and that's the squat that, that would be most applicable for a sprinter. You take that versus an Olympic lifter and, and they've got to catch that bar really deep in the squat. So doing real depth squats with the toes pointed out is better. So it always makes me laugh that people will look at, you know, I'll have different clients coming in and from one client to the next, I'm asking them to do something different because I've talked about differences about, about sports, where the way I'd get a sprint to squat is different to how I'd get an Olympic weightlifter to squat. But what about the, the people? You know, women have shallower hip sockets, which generally means they have to go wider on their feet than a male would. And some males do also have shallow hip sockets, so they have to go wide. The deeper the hip sockets generally, the narrower you can go. I know I have quite deep hip sockets because I can squat with my feet right next to each other. And I'm perfectly fine. And I have short femurs. I have little, little legs. I'm relatively tall, but my height comes from my torso, not my legs. So anthropometrics plays a, plays a huge part in that as well. Um, so we can't, we can't slam everyone in, in this one size fits all that we always try and do. So, you know, the sport they're playing will change how I make them squat, but also how they walk in my gym, their muscle imbalances, injuries that they've had, uh, depth of the hips that, that they have um what else oh some people's hips are just turned out more than others like like the sockets are at a different angle so they're probably gonna have to turn their feet out more um you know saying nine out of ten people need to turn their toes out um is great but that leaves one one out of ten that doesn't and um you know you start applying that to millions of people and that's a lot of people that that's toes need to need to be turned in and that's just one example 
we, we can look, we can find many examples uh, like that. There's huge differences. 10% uh, of the population don't have a transverse abdominis. I watched, uh, I, I was, I was being a bit mean. I, strength and conditioning can be a little bit like a, uh, I'm trying to think of the PC version of this phrase. Um, a chest beating, we'll say. Um, uh, they like to tell you how much better they are than you. And one guy was going, yeah, well, we always test the strength of the transverse abdominis. And of course, me being, being me, I was like, oh, well, how do you know your clients have one? Uh, because 10% ten, ten of the population don't have the transverse abdominis. It's, it's not there. So how are you testing the strength of a muscle if it doesn't exist? Yeah. I think it's 12% don't have the plantaris. So anyway, that's the uh, end of my, let's stop sharing that. I'll just, you can just see my, my pretty face. Um, it's getting quite dark now, even with my, my light on. Sorry about that. So uh, that's it for the, the presentation. Um, I hope you, you took something out of it, enjoyed it to, to a point, and it wasn't just me battering it on. Um, if anyone has any questions, throw them in the, throw them in the chat box now, and I'll uh, try and try and answer them best I can. No problem. Stop my.